Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the first ever virtual SQL Saturday LA. Um, I hope the format works for us. I've uh, done this session uh, many times uh, for a bunch of audience, uh, anywhere from uh, DBAs to DB developers to developers to just uh, business folks uh, who don't aren't too technical. And um, I try to keep it uh, kind of light and interactive. Um, the idea is just to maybe answer in an hour as many questions as we can, uh, digging as deep as we can into uh, MongoDB, uh, getting kind of a notion of what it is, what it's for, um, uh, why should I use it, um, maybe how does it work internally, and uh, where you can get more resources after that, because uh, obviously we're not going to know everything there is to know in one hour. Um, and uh, this last question, if you are not familiar, Google up uh, Mongo is web scale. It's a very funny, not necessarily best uh, language in the world, maybe not uh, safe for work, but it is on YouTube. You can watch it. It's kind of funny um, uh, video uh, that to watch, and uh, it's asking whether Mongo is really web scale. It's an old video, Mongo Engine Today has been rewritten at least one and a half times since that video came out back in 2011. 2011 is when I started uh, using it. I have a background in software and uh, I've always used uh, SQL Server uh, for uh, quite high scale, uh, you know, online dating sites and line of business applications and a high transaction per second kind of stuff. Um, and uh, at some point I decided I don't like to use ORMs. That was fairly early, I didn't like it. But uh, at some point I decided I don't necessarily like to just use a tabular concept and I heard of Mongo and I decided to start using it. And ever since uh, I saw that more and more I can use it as a backing store for uh, backing database for applications and I've been using it where I found it appropriate. Still many places, I don't think it's necessarily the best solution, uh, then don't use it if it's not uh, a good fit. Um, so is it really worth my time? So if you come from a background that um, has a lot of uh, SQL or MDX even, or any of that, the question is, do I really need to learn this technology? Is this something that uh, I should invest my time in? Um, so if you are using data and you are a data professional, the answer is pretty much yes, I think. Uh, Mongo is uh, one of the more popular data platforms out there. Its uh, open source uh, uh, version is extremely, uh, very widely used and uh, the licensed uh, version for enterprises that need even more features is also very well supported and popular. And uh, just because uh, the way it works and what it offers developers and application uh, architects to do, uh, people like it. So if you are looking to extend your knowledge into uh, what is popular and out there today and good career opportunities, that's definitely something to look into. So aren't there enough databases? Um, well, that is probably the biggest and hardest question to answer. Uh, the answer is yes, there are enough databases. But at every stage of our lives, we saw that, you know, the next version brings another feature or changes in features or optimizations or insights into exactly what workloads work best, under what conditions, what syntax to use, how to construct your clusters and your uh, machines, anywhere from the physical machine all the way up to the query, uh, and we just saw a talk about optimization. At any given point, the question is really, what is your workload? Not what is the best database. What is the best database for my workload? So when you start looking at the variety of workloads we encounter today, um, all the considerations of, of cost, cost to develop, flexibility, everything comes into mind. And at that point, 
I don't know that there are enough databases in the world. I think that databases that try to be everything for everyone uh, can't do a great job at doing one thing the most awesome way. And since our work and variety of challenges is so big, uh, it comes a time where you find yourself saying, you know what, the databases in the market are not quite satisfying what I need, so uh, maybe I need yet another one. Um, so use what you like. Uh, I'm not going to recommend using Mongo for everything uh, because I don't think it's the best at everything. That being said, I think um, it's good at a lot of things, so uh, I found it very useful. Now, can you use your SQL skills? Can you use your uh, knowledge of SQL 92 or windowing functions you learned about or things like that? The answer is no, not really. You can't use your syntax knowledge because the syntax used to access MongoDB is not SQL. Having said that, I know there are some ODBC drivers that allow you to open a seemingly ODBC connection and access Mongo as if it's a set of tables with rows and has a, a schema you can access. Um, my recommendation on that, I know you didn't ask, but my recommendation is just stay away from it. If you're using Mongo really, you are choosing a document-oriented database. Trying to pretend it's a tabular database is going to lead you into performance problems at the very least, if not all of their logical or shortcomings seemingly from a tabular view. It is just not made for that. Um, if you are treating Mongo as, uh, as a, a store for tables in rows, you might as well use a database that lets you store things in tables and rows. Those database engines, notably SQL Server, are way better at tables and rows. Mongo just doesn't do it. So how do I get started, right? Well, it's kind of simple. You have to start MongoDB, and then you connect to it, and then you can create documents. I'll talk more about documents in a bit. And then you can query documents. Instead of talking a lot, let me just switch here really quick. The first thing I need to do is start Mongo. So Mongo is just a, a process called Mongo. It's already in my path, so if I did uh, dear uh, see, well, let's see, uh, program files, uh, Mong MongoDB, um, server, uh, I have 4.0 here, bin. So if I look here, I will see a process called Mongo. This is the Mongo shell. In MongoD, that is the Mongo daemon. The rest of the execution, uh, executables here are all uh, kind of utilities. Uh, you don't need them. If you just took this process, MongoD, and dropped it on a box, this is the Mongo database. It's already in my path, so I don't have to type long paths. So I'll say Mongo D, that's the Mongo daemon. And if it's a database, it needs to store database data somewhere. So I need to tell it where to store the data, right? If I reboot the machine, I want the data to be on disk somewhere. So that is under dash dash db path. And I'll give it an empty directory here. Uh, I'm in the temp directory. There's a fresh directory with a data uh, subdirectory. And I'm going to use that. So this is it, Mongo is now running, and it's telling me that it is listening on port 27017. Dear diary, I just ran the Mongo server. No dongles in the back of the computer, no CDs, no Aura net to install, no DLLs, no nothing. Just Mongo D the process, and this comes in varieties on Linux and Mac OS if you need. Uh, so it's compiled uh, C++, you don't need extra libraries, extra anything, you just need to run the process. Okay, so that was step one in our slide, start MongoDB, cool. Next thing, I need to connect to it. The philosophy of Mongo is out of the box, it should just work. So if I just type in Mongo, this is without the letter D, that's a Mongo shell, and hit enter, it figures 
oh, you want to start a shell? Sure. And you want to connect to a Mongo, but you didn't tell me which one. So I'll just look for Mongo on the regular port on this machine. And voila, we're actually inside Mongo. We see the blinking prompt here on the bottom. I'll bring it to the top. We are in Mongo. And from here, I have concepts such as DB. This is the namespace I'm in. I'm in a database called test. I can say show DBs and see that there's a bunch of housekeeping stuff like admin and local and config, but really there's um, nothing, no data yet anywhere. Um, notice that when I say show DBs, it didn't show me the test database because it's just a namespace. When there's no data, there's no actual physical storage carved out for it. Only when I start creating data is there um, any uh, database object really created and put in the system catalog and stuff like that. So let's create a document. Let's create some data. Um, let's see. Let's say I want to switch databases. I say use, pass, and this will tell me I switch to the database pass. So if I type db enter, it will say you're in the pass database. I say show collections, and it says you have nothing. So db dot uh, say demo dot insert uh, something with uh, say I I'll, I'll give it a document ID is zero name is Bob and it says I inserted this document uh, there's a right result it's all good so db dot demo dot find and it finds the document I just inserted. I can stop and start the database. It will still be there. I hope you take my word for it. Nothing much to say. If I say show collections now, it will say, aha, there's a demo collection. So before, just before I inserted, there was no collection. And now there's one collection. So notice I didn't say, hold on, here we go. I'm going to create a database. Is that okay with you? Oh, I'm going to need a collection to store my document. Is that okay with you? Please make a collection only accept documents that have a field name and field ID and all of that. No. Mongo is a very, very different beast. It doesn't work this way. It's a document-oriented database, and it has what's called a flexible schema. So it's really different from how we think about other, definitely the tabular world, uh, definitely SQL Server, Oracles, the Postgres of the world require you to do DDL, right? They require you to declare, I'm going to have a table and here is the spec exactly for the table and here's, you know, what are the columns in it and here's the data type of every column and oh my God, do all of this stuff before you can even put one row in. And there's a reason for it, right? We want to maintain a very strict shape of what data comes in in order to assure ourselves that when we query it and find the data, it is data that only adheres to our spec. Mongo decided to take a different tack on this. It decided that instead of serializing data into rows and tables, it will serialize it as a series of BSON documents. BSON is a little like JSON, except not really. It is binary. It does not use strings so much. It uses native data types. It's kind of a buffer, maybe a little closer to Avro or something like that, where it serializes this key value pairs or arrays or whatever you throw at it into a bunch of bytes that are all contiguous in memory, a buffer. And those buffers are just stored by the engine in blocks of IO and served to you when you call them up. So what is this document we speak of? So we serialize it to BSON, but document is kind of a, a notion that you can have fields and values. So I can have ID with a value zero, or a value one, or a value Bob, or a value of a date time, or a value of some binary amalgamation of bytes. It could be anything we want. It's not JSON because JSON doesn't have type fidelity. So there are JSON databases out there, uh, namely things like um, uh, uh, Couch, uh, CouchDB, uh, both have um, uh, uh, 
uh, JSON documents stored. They actually serialize things as JSON, and they deal with the client in terms of JSON over HTTP, and not in Mongo. Mongo uses BSON internally and BSON over the wire. So just like SQL Server has TDS tabular data stream to to go over uh, the the network, uh, Mongo uses a serialization into BSON. And tight fidelity is very important because you can declare a byte, you can declare a dual byte, you can declare an int, a long, a decimal. Uh, you can do precise numerics uh, using decimal and do uh, accounting stuff. If you try to do it with JSON, there's not really a great representation of precise numerics. There's the JavaScript number, which is a kind of funky um, representation that, that behaves um, not always like you want it uh, in mathematical terms. And yes, there's ways to deal with it in JavaScript, but JSON itself doesn't serialize any different for them. Uh, so in order to, to gain tight fidelity and in order to uh, allow to serialize uh, very conveniently, BSON was invented. Uh, so values are strongly typed. Uh, we also can support uh, lists or sets of items. So what does that look like? Maybe instead of this document here that I show, right, maybe I want to have, uh, you know what, let me see if I can copy this and extend it a bit. So maybe there's Bob and he likes, you know what, we'll have another person. That person will be Kim. Um, and Kim likes, um, uh, bacon and uh, coffee. I'm lying. It's not Kim. It's Nuri, and I like bacon and coffee. And I'll give myself a different ID, ID one. Why not? So this is an array. You see this object here that I'm describing. Uh, doc equal. This object here that I'm describing is has keys and values. Some of them are integers. This, uh, it's, this number is actually a double. Um, this is a string and likes is an array of strings. And further, I could uh, into doc dot add uh, address, let's say, uh, I can say, you know, street is uh, one, two, three main and zip is uh, 90405, and what else can I do? Um, so this is an object, and now my document has nested elements. So you see two things you can't do in a single SQL row. One is to store an array of items. Second is to reference or to embed uh, an address into the single document. And Mongo is quite happy of taking it. So db.demo.insert this doc I just uh, showed you on screen says OK. And now db.demo.find will show me all of the content of the demo collection. And you can see that it's Mongo is fine with having some documents that have similar properties, like the first two, ID and name, and some that are totally different, like this Bob doesn't have likes and doesn't have a street address. Mongo's fine with that. It doesn't care. It doesn't actually store extra nulls for Bob. It just, this is the whole document for Bob. So if this is uh, 12 bytes, then this is 12 bytes. That's that. And if this takes 123, then that's 123. And that's that. And Mongo is quite happy to store them together. So this is, again, very, very different from how we are accustomed to think of if we need to store this in tabular, what would we need? We would need a table for the person, right, with a person ID, and then we would need a table of likes, and then we haven't decided yet whether these likes are universal, and then we need a table of likes and a table of person likes to relate what you like and a person, or whether maybe we just have a direct link that says there's a like of bacon related to the idea of Nuri in one table. But either way we look at it, we need another one or two tables just to store the likes. 
and for address, we could, in theory, store this as address one street, address one uh, zip, address one city, address one thing in the main table, right? But the moment we would try to say, oh, you have shipping address, you have billing address, you have a home address, we will probably put this address outside to a separate table of addresses, and then we'd have address type, and then we'll have some table relating address, address types, and address owner to the user, so an address user mapping table. So you could see that this kind of stuff that I'm really trying to keep some tabs on a customer or one of my users uh, that, whose name is Nuri and he likes these things, this here represents it very, very directly. And this is one of the reasons people uh, really like to do it because now if I'm asking, hey, give me the customer profile, I can just load this one document and I have the whole thing. I don't have to chase around and do joins and torture my optimizer to figure out how to join these things. It's all here. It's all one document, right? So no biggie. Um, and what I showed you on uh, address, it's called a sub document. So the, a field that contains document with yet more fields and uh, values in it is a sub document. It's what we saw here on screen that the address has an object, a sub document, and that object had again keys and values. You agree? Yes, sir. Um, so there are questions. Are there any source control for MongoDB? Basically, DevOps. Um, I'd like to understand the question better. There, this. So I'm in the shell. So MongoDB itself is just a database engine. So MongoD is a process. It you know you give it commands to manipulate, insert, remove, da da da. It does those. It also keeps a change stream in in terms of what it did. So if I kind of like redo log in Oracle or the log for truncation and durability. If you are looking for source control for your commands, what you typed, this shell is just, it has a .mongo.rc file, just like Linux has, you know, your .rc file. I unmuted that attendee. Uh, Alpha, please uh, feel free to ask questions. Mm. I think I'm fine now. Yeah, I okay. got it, yeah. Okay, what about the second one, the MongoDB in which station? So share usage of MongoDB. I'm sorry, the question is what? Yes. Can you please share usage of MongoDB? I mean, where MongoDB is more suitable? Um, I, it's useful when you have microservices for sure. So if the application that is using the database is a microservice architecture, it is very useful because typically you can narrow down your use case to a few key scenarios and support them with a document that fits it well. In that case, you will find that you will be developing very rapidly. Uh, you don't have to have a lot of back and forth on schema design because the application owns the schema or the document shape. And the performance characteristics uh, can be achieved uh, fairly easily. Um, I, I, would say, I would say that it is harder to use Mongo the more wide your domain is. Like if you have a whole enterprise, in the whole enterprise you want a unified view of every aspect of every piece of data and uh, you know kind of stuff, that becomes difficult because Mongo doesn't really, it, it has something simulating a join, but it doesn't really have a, a, an idea of a foreign key and because of that our our ideas of like uh, star schema or data warehouse are difficult to implement in mongo uh, that being said like i it, like i kind of counted here look at this one document this one document if i have to think tabular 
I would need at least probably there will be a table of likes, a table of user likes to relate the likes to the user, right? So table of user, one. Table of likes, two. Table of addresses, three. And then one to relate likes and users, that's four. And another one, address to user is five. Already I have five tables, five schema objects I have to create. Five storage locations they will have to occur on five terms in my join in order to cobble them all together. Everything times five. So there's an overhead tax that we assume is all good and great because of our training about denormalization, but it's not necessarily the best thing for developers. It's not necessarily fastest to develop and definitely not easy to change. Um, so the flexible schema, the flexible document model gives you very, very good uh, advantages there. Hope this answered the question. So schema is really not our key stuff. Like why do we want to take, you know, my bacon and my coffee and somebody else likes the same thing and now somebody else says no it's bacon strip so now we have to create another row for bacon strip and not just bacon or thick bacon or maple bacon or something no dude this is just what i like i told you i like maple bacon put maple bacon and if somebody else likes bacon in a different way or doesn't like bacon at all that's fine too like just store it however they said it however the application wants to see it that's fine so Schema flexibility is very, uh, very key to the to the use scenarios here. Okay, so I said there's flexibility. There's also a tad of uh, a few things to take care of. Uh, every document does have to have an ID. I showed you in the demo here just two, three IDs that are all numeric. Mongo is flexible on that that it's numeric it can you can use numeric you can use string you can use uuids you can use object ids date times you can use many many types not arrays but many types but um, you have to have an id and the id field must be named underscore id there's no choice so unlike somewhere else where you could declare a table and decide what the column you decide is the primary key is uh, in MongoDB, you can create alternate fields with indexes on them and even unique indexes, but you must have an ID field. Second schema limitation is that document size must be within 16 megabytes. If it doesn't fit in 16 megabyte, um, you, uh, it, Mongo will produce an error. You just cannot increase the size of a document to above 16 or insert anything above 16. Now, if you do have a database, a single document that is 16 megabytes, I want you to start talking to me because I want to understand what that use case. Really, when you're thinking about what documents represent, which is a unit of interaction with the application, under what scenario do we want to interact in a query way, in a meaningful data way, not just store my video, you know? Like, what, what is a meaningful piece of data or collection of fields that that get to this size i mean i don't remember how much the whole encyclopedia britannica was but i think it fits in a few megabytes i don't know so that's a limitation and if you do really want to control and say every document in the people collection must have name there are ways to enforce schema your application, first of all, should be doing it, not Mongo, the server, but there is a way to put a schema validator that will uh, do JSON, JSON style validation on specific fields. So if you want to declare that a field must exist or the field must exist and have a data type or things like that, you can actually uh, do that if you're worried that the schema is too varied among different documents within the same collection. So I showed you strings, numbers, and arrays. Um, just for giggles, uh, doc, 
uh, here's my document. Uh, so I'll add a date of birth, right? So doc dot dob equals let's say I saw date of um, uh, 1984-01-02 or something. So now my document has a proper uh, date time object. On screen it looks like some kind of funny things. Binary speaking internally it stores it as a 8 byte just kind of like Unix epoch, a UTC based. So that is also possible. And I could say something like db.demo.save the doc, which would have added, uh, slammed the document uh, and replaced everything on it. But I would recommend staying away from the save scenario because what did I just do? I took the database and I told Mongo to take the whole document and just slam it on top whatever was there. So what if Steve took the document and read Nuri and wanted to give me one point and then my uh, other colleague also wanted to take my document and add one point? Well, so if I have a document that started with say uh, points is one, Steve reads it, he says, aha, it should be points two. He takes it into his computer, sets point to two, shoves it back in. The other person takes it also at the same time. They both took it when it said point one. And now the other person thought, aha, I should add a point. Now it should be two and they slam it in. But wait a minute. If both Steve and Bob wanted to give me one point, the number of points I should have is three because it started with one and each one of them added one point, right? So if I have the uh, points is one, right? So d dot points, oops, d dot points. So this is one, right? And if I say this plus plus, um, sorry, uh, plus equal one, I want it to be higher. So if two people incremented it and then saved it, it should have been three. So the way to do it in Mongo is not actually by saving, it is by using an operator called increment. Uh, so I can say, say db.demo, dot update and who do I want to update? I want to update the person with a name of Bob. And what do I want to do? I want to dollar increment the field uh, points by one. Okay. I'll hit enter and it says I found one meaning it found somebody with a name Bob. Remember, we had Bob in the beginning. And I didn't have to upsert, basically, I didn't have to replace a document because I found one, and I modified it. So let's find now. And I see that Bob now has one point. I said increment by one, so it knows it's a numeric field. It found no field at all. So it says, okay, it's almost like they had zero points and it added one point. And if I <clears throat> exercise it again twice, I will now find that Bob has three points. When I use this operator increment, it actually does it at the server. So concurrency is resolved. And if I'm really, really worried, that I want to give Bob, I see that he has uh, three points. Uh, let's just look at it again. Bob has three points. I want to say, I want to give Bob one more points based on the fact that he has three, but I want him to have one more than he has today. If I want to make sure that I don't accidentally give him too much, many points, I can even say, you know, if his name is Bob and the number of points 
he has is three, then give him one point. I'll run it once. And of course, this was the condition. So he got one more point. I'll run it again. This time, nothing matched. Why? Because there is no more Bob that has three points, only a Bob that has four points already. So this found nothing and incremented nothing. As a result, Mongo is smart enough to know I'm making no change. So concurrency, you can resolve at the database level or you can resolve uh, by client if you issue smart queries about what exactly you want updated. And that is a much uh, cleaner way of doing things. And there's other operators like, uh, let's say I can find um, somebody whose uh, name is uh, Nuri and I can uh, find out that uh, he also likes um, what is it? Uh, bacon, coffee. What else do I like? I don't know. Trapeze. And now, when I find, I will see that this field likes. I pushed another item into this array. So arrays are special in Mongo and they can be treated as either a sequence or a set. Uh, so if I say push again, you will see that that has twice because this is just treating it as a sequence. But I can also say add to set and I'll find something else. And if I do this until I'm blue in the face, since I'm saying treat this array of likes as a set, each item will be only there once. And you can see that even though I added to the set jazz three times, really just the first time it did something and modified it, and the other three times it did nothing. It says, you already have it in the set, dude. Thank you for letting me know you want jazz there. It is there, you're all good. It's not an error because it's you said, hey, make it so that he has jazz in there. And Mongo says, yep, I made it so he has it. I didn't have to do anything, but haha, you did have it already. Yes. Since you're actually going to find, so this is what I heard. I actually have no experience with MongoDB, but mm -hmm. what I heard is that MongoDB is case sensitive. You cannot change it, right? Uh, almost, yeah, no. Okay. Uh, no. Yeah, so MongoDB is case sensitive, yes. However, you can create indexes. And when you create index on a field, let's say name, you can create a index with collation of English with case uh -huh. insensitive and diacritic insensitive or sensitive, however you want. So because you can apply collation to an index, any query using that index will be able to then type Bob, capital B, lowercase b, mixed case, whatever. Can you apply it on the whole instance? You can, um, so you don't apply indexes on the whole index. You, ah. when you create index, you say db.demo.create uh, index on a field, uh, say Bob, uh, sorry, and in, in the field name, uh, direction ascending, let's say. And it's this point is where you can say it's collation technology. and, you know, lang, uh, you, I don't remember the, the exact okay, syntax. Well, yeah. And also there is no GUI for MongoDB, right? That just doesn't exist. Um, there's actually a bunch. Let me go to a little, uh, since you asked about indexing, uh, plus okay. in consulting, uh, I'll go to my website here for a second because I have a blog about Mongo that is this one, uh, this article here, don't be so case sensitive. Uh, shows you what happened exactly with case sensitivity and Mongo and indexing. It is a very short read, um, but it shows you 
query optimizer and uh, conditions around indexing. People used to use this format, and uh, thank you for bringing this up. Please don't use regex for your queries. It is the least efficient way of querying. Um, it, it can cause uh, a lot of headache if you're relying on regex queries. Uh, think of designing things a little better. Um, so it, it, it will do collection scans, which is equivalent to full table scans. Um, there are ways to use indexes, uh, but then it will be an index key scan if you use a regex. But what you want to do is an index match. Um, so you can do index matches that are a little more concise with regex, and you can also do finally, uh, you can do collation, locale, and strength and do this. So actually I can just copy this, show you right here. I know I'm going way deep here in an intro, but you're all database professionals, so hopefully it makes sense. So now I can say find, um, you know, name Bob, Um, it will find it. I think I need to, yeah, so it didn't find it here, but if I hint to use the collation index, which is name one, huh, I have to check why I'm not fitting. I have to check exactly what the syntax for doing it here. Oh yeah. Another question on find. I heard that if you're trying to find something that uh, doesn't exist, MongoDB is not smart enough to tell you it doesn't exist. It tells you that <clears throat> it found no records. I'm not sure why that makes a difference for you. So let's say you are trying to, like in SQL Server, you're trying to select data from a particular column. So SQL yes. Server will tell you, I have no idea what the column is, so I cannot do it. Versus you're looking for a particular record in that field, and it tells you, I found zero records. Y yes, but in a world of document oriented that comes with a territory so if you see the total uh, db.demo.find um, both these documents have name uh, but uh, this guy has points uh, this guy i'm not sure has points actually and this guy nuri has likes but uh, bob doesn't have likes so Imagine now I have a billion documents. Some of them have some fields, some of them don't. There may be a condition where some field is omnipresent, in, it's present in every document among the billion. But there could be that no documents have shared fields at all. I'm not saying I recommend storing data that way, but I'm saying it's possible. So if you tell me, hey, Give me everybody whose who's, uh, street address is in zip 90405. Do you want to say, no, wait a minute, nobody has street address or nobody has zip code? It's just a query. The question was, the, not the question, the workload was, please retrieve for me all documents who match this pattern. A address with a zip code of 90405, db.demo.find. Somebody with the address dot zip code equaling 90405. Oops, what did I do? It's zip, not zip code. Right? So do you want it to start saying, wait a minute, but Bob doesn't even have this field, so I'll return a row that says he, Bob doesn't have it? No. You said, yeah, give me the ones who have that field, and it gives you the ones that have that field. And if the answer right, comes up empty, it's just saying, I don't have those. All right, or I don't have any records for that. I think that's kind of, so you're right. 
if there is no column, you should look for a column. But if you make a mistake and you're typing zip instead of zip code, you, right. you're not intentionally making a mistake, but you're getting no records. So you think, well, you know what? I have no records, except that that column doesn't exist because you mistype it. Right. So because we don't have a rigid schema definition, we do not have a way to say you ask for something silly versus the thing yeah. you ask for has happens to have no matching. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay. So I showed you a little update. I showed you a little insert. I showed you matching, uh, like find me people whose name is Bob or zip code is this. I actually showed you also nesting, where the zip code is in a sub document of address and I could retrieve. So Mongo, even though this is flexible schema, Mongo totally understands me. And if I wanted to create an index on address.zip code, so if I look at this and I say explain, it will tell me, oh, I had to do a collection scan for it. But I can define an index on uh, address dot zip and then when I run this query it will say aha I could use this index on the zip code inside the address so this is not like taking XML and shoving it into a column or taking some JSON and doing some trickery behind the scene that Postgres lets you do this is a fully fledged document oriented engine that understands document structures and it is capable of indexing array elements as well as uh, nested fields as well as fields of any type so this is a very very different engine okay um, so I showed you slam update that was uh, saving a document just saying take the whole document slam it whatever that ID was now the value is replaced with whatever I gave you now. I don't care if what fields were there before. There's surgical update, meaning I just want to touch one field. I want to set a value to something. I want to increment some numeric. I want to change uh, elements in an array. All of those are possible. I can even delete fields, individual fields. I can say unset the field lottery winner for people I don't want to win the lottery, as if I have that power. Um, there's also the ability to upstart. Uh, I, I'm not going to dive too much into these demos. I'll take a few more questions and talk about other uh, issues. And um, so upstart is the idea that you want to create or update a document. If it's there, update it. If it's not there, please create one. Uh, Mongo has that capability. And uh, there's also multi-update. So when you saw here that I issued a um, update for anybody named Bob. Sorry, it was the update. Anybody named Nuri would have been updated. So if I have a billion people in some countries, they have a popular name Nuri, um, then you know all of them will be updated by this. I can update multiple documents. It's not just one at a time. And this is important to remember, especially in context of other database engines that talk to you in JSON and actually they're just key blob stores. They only have an index on the primary key and you have to submit the whole document and that's that. They slam the document in and change version and that's that. Mongo internally has the understanding of fields. So speed, we have indexes. Um, as I showed you, you can index nested fields, top level fields, fields of different types, all of that. There's a query planner, uh, not as robust as a SQL Server, but there definitely is one. <clears throat> and you can use that to see if your query would be efficient and try to tune which indexes exactly and how to run queries, what kind of terms to submit to, to hit the best optimal performance. Um, in addition to 
performance considerations and tuning of the indexes and so forth, you might want to look at your working set, which is uh, when you're dealing with massive amounts of data, when you're getting into the you know hundreds of gig and terabytes or peptabytes, you definitely want to narrow your working set and figure out how to have workloads that can largely fit in memory. The workload fit in memory doesn't mean all of Mongo documents in memory. It means the index should fit in memory, ideally, and the results that should fit in memory. <clears throat> and you should fetch as few documents as possible so that Mongo doesn't have to spend all server resources on a single query. And just like if for those of you who are DBAs, Mongo has the notion of uh, sessions and things, and you can say db.current op. Um, and get a list of what are the in-progress uh, operations. So if there's a rogue query that's running too long, you can figure out what it's doing, who is connecting, all of that stuff, and, and maybe even kill some long-running operations that are hung or anything like that. So <clears throat> on the face of it, I'm doing things that are very simplistic, right? db.demo, that, fine. But under the but under the surface, it's a fully fledged database engine with a lot of bells and whistles and a lot of uh, tunability and control that you could exercise. It is a very full, a very uh, fairly mature uh, uh, ecosystem of syntax and language and management and user management. There's security, there's authorization, authentication, encryption at rest, encryption over the wire, all of these bells and whistles. So. Uh, a fairly robust system. Nuri? Yes, sir. Question from Robert. Can you bulk load data in, into MongoDB? Um, so, bulk load, uh, yes and no. Um, so, when you see me typing into the shell, it actually gets translated to a database command, and there is a database command to insert and also to update. <clears throat> now, if I want to, instead of sending one command saying, are you good, and then another command, and then for a million documents, running a million commands and a, a million uh, chases to say, what's the status of my command, uh, which is two million operations, you can batch things and send multiple commands in one, multiple operations in one command in bulk. And that bulk could be ordered or unordered. So the fastest would be unordered because then Mongo can parallelize executing those. So, so far it sounds like the answer is yes. You can submit bulk commands and therefore the notion of bulk loading, uh, like BCP in and stuff like that, uh, kind of exist. But it's not exactly like that because if you are doing it outside of a scope of a transaction, each document mutation itself, each bulk, in, each item in the bulk insert ex executes uh, independently or um, or not at all. Uh, but the whole batch doesn't stop necessarily on any one of them. So if I gave Mongo a thousand documents and for some reason it failed the right one the other 999 will be there. So it's not a transactional batch load. And further, as of today at least, tricks we used to do with tables like um, table partitions, where you load into an offline partition and then do a catalog swap into the main table in order to avoid the locking, those don't really exist in Mongo today. What about loading data from a file? Um, so the Mongo utilities include something called uh, Mongo import. And Mongo import allows you to read a CSV or TSV or JSON file and load it into Mongo. So you can do that. Got it, thank you. Uh, how much time do we have here? We actually reached our time, 3.15. Yeah. 
So uh, I do want to close down by mentioning just replica sets and sharding. Uh, replica sets are Mongo's way of creating a cluster that is replicated. It is high availability that you take three Mongo nodes, let's say, and one is primary. And if it crashes for whatever reason, the others take over and you don't have to wake up at 3 a.m. to recover the cluster. It automatically recovers and you continue on operation. So it's better than hot standby. It's hot standby that steps in automatically. And then sharding is the notion of taking a big workload or a big data set. Let's say you have a petabyte of information or you know 10 terabytes, and you create multiple Mongo mini clusters that all operate as if one logical cluster. So this is a little more like MongoDB's, eh, sorry, like SQL Server's federated eh, arrangement where it's a, a single table or collection is partitioned across multiple physical servers and the query router routes your, pay, your workload to one or more uh, of those shards, of those uh, instances, and they are actually doing the physical work and then coming back to you. And for you, the user, you don't care where it came from. It just knows how to scatter gather the results. Uh, so that is sharding, and um, yeah, that's a, a whole new topic. Okay, so I'll take uh, more questions, or uh, thanks for bearing with me. Hopefully, sound quality was good. Uh, question, could you recommend a good resource to learn MongoDB for DBAs? Um, well, I can promote my own courses on Plural site. I have uh, like I think four, four, four or five courses on Plural site. Um, so that's that's um, if you want, there's a course on uh, MongoDB admin there that is packed with a lot of the basics and a lot of topics, including monitoring, tuning, and everything. Um, and then uh, I would also say that Mongo University from MongoDB themselves is a, a pretty good resource. They run MOOCs, uh, massive online. So MongoDB uh, University is a, a resource and you can learn there. Uh, my course is on Pluralsight. Um, so I have a bunch of courses there. Yeah, I have about five now. And uh, uh, you can, you can, uh, check out some of the courses there. Um, and uh, the MongoDB's documentation, I think, is very, very good. They do a very good job. So if you're more of a reader than a video watcher, I would definitely recommend reading through there. They have good production notes, good practical advice, as well as good documentation of the feature proper. So those are all uh, useful. Uh, somebody asked about uh, UI. There are two really to look at uh, in my book. One of them is Mongo's own compass. So MongoDB compass is uh, UI. Uh, and it's freely downloadable now and you can use it. It lets you interact with things, do light graphing in things <coughs> and Visualize and also helps you visualize as as well as write queries uh, with autocompletes and discovering fields and stuff. And another one is Robo. It used to be Robo Mongo. Now it's called Robo 3T. Robo, uh, Robo 3T. Uh, so Robo 3T is the free version, and then there's Studio 3T, which is a paid one. Uh, this is a very robust tool that is built specifically to be uh, Mongo UI and it's doing a great job at it. So those are UI tools I would recommend looking at. Myself, I like to use the shell. Um, shell teaches me commands. The shell is scriptable. I can run JavaScript scripts. So I don't like uh, typing on the fly in production. I like to prepare everything in JavaScript, run it, run it again, run it again. Uh, somebody asked about source control. I just don't like the idea of going in and typing and fat fingering a problem and suddenly becoming a production problem. So um, definitely I like using the shell for that. 
uh, and loading the script and running it rather than using UI and clicking around and who knows what happens. Got it. Uh, that looks like all the questions. Nuri, thanks a lot. Thanks to all the attendees that attended Nuri's uh, MongoDB session.